The meeting tonight is, uh, features a lecture by Professor Martin Polyakov. Now, I, isn't Google wonderful? I, I've spent an hour or two Googling Professor Polyakov this afternoon to write this introduction, so forgive me if any of it's wrong. So. Uh, blame Google, I do. Um, he studied at King's College, Cambridge, and got his PhD in 1973 on the matrix isolation of large molecules. In 1972, he was appointed to senior research officer in the Department of Inorganic Chemistry of the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. In 1979, he moved to a lectureship in the Department of Chemistry here in Nottingham, being promoted to uh, reader and then professor of chemistry in 1985 and 1991, respectively. He holds a number of other academic posts, the, uh, among which are honorary professor of chemistry at Moscow State University and a member of the Chemical Society of Ethiopia good one. He was elected fellow of the Royal Society in 2002 and is currently the, their vice president. He was awarded the CBE in 2008 for <coughs> services to science. His research interests include chemical applications of supercritical fluids with particular emphasis on green chemistry. One of his recent papers, a modified Golden Gate attenuated total reflection cell for monitoring phase transitions in multi-component fluids at high temperatures, uh, introduces a new continuous flow method using attenuated total reflection infrared spectroscopy for monitoring phase transitions in multi-component fluids at high pressures and temperatures. Um, I almost had a stroke the first time I read that, so he's promised not to mention it no. tonight. <coughs> More accessible are the videos he produces with Brady Harron, which you can see on periodicvideos.com, though I stopped at 96. As far as I know, Professor Polyakov's the only person in the room who's had the entire periodic table engraved on one of his hairs. Tonight, he's going to talk mainly on education and chemistry and getting young people interested in chemistry, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Professor Polyakov, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, first of all, I'm delighted to see so many of you here. And I should say, particularly to the younger people here, that when I was your age, or even much, much older than you, I would have never dreamt that I would be giving a lecture on this topic. So it is surprising where life can lead you. So I thought I would begin just saying a little bit about myself, um, if I can get this to work. So I was born in the UK in 1947, so you can work out my age well, you can't actually because it's, I haven't had my birthday yet this year. So. Um, and my father was Russian and my mother was English. So I speak Russian, but not perfectly. And I did PhD at Cambridge, a doctorate. And I, as you heard, worked in New, Newcastle. And I have been in Nottingham for a long time. And my current title is Research Professor in Chemistry. This has no meaning, but I made it up myself because it sounded nice. And um, I'm working in an area called green chemistry, which I will tell you a little bit about later. My brother writes plays, and one of my sisters, I have two sisters, is a doctor. So this is my sister Lucinda. This is from the photo from her practice page in, um, in the internet. And this is my brother Stephen um, shooting one of his films. You may have seen his films on television. And if you're not, you can buy them from Amazon. And there's time to get them before Christmas. And um, he's my little brother. And our father, who's here, Alex Polyakov, started a company called Multitone, which was the producer of the first pages for use in hospitals. For those of you who are not doctors, pages are things you have in your pocket which bleep when you're needed to help somebody. And this is the first pager that was made. And here you can see a doctor, not a very good role model, um, here wearing a pager. Um, and the patient looks quite ill, if not actually dead. And the... Um, <laughs> so... 
But so there is a small connection with, the, with medicine. But um, my area is green chemistry, which are cleaner approaches for making chemicals and materials. So the idea is that you should think about something in the lab, invent something in the lab, and all being well, transfer this to a factory so you can make chemicals more cleanly. And um, my particular area is trying to find cleaner solvents for dissolving chemicals to do chemical reactions. And so my work is on the borders of chemistry and chemical engineering. Chemical engineering is the engineering that you do to build chemical plants and the like. So we begin with the first question, which is what is the difference between doctors and chemical engineers? So this is for you to answer. Yes. Any ideas? Any guesses? So a dim audience. Yes. Well, that's a very good answer. But this is what, in the education, is called the guess what I'm thinking question, in which I know the answer and you don't. And the answer is that chemical engineers don't have to study chemistry, <laughs> which I think is extraordinary. And um, they just, when they're designing their chemical plant, they have one chemical they call A, and another one they call B, and they mix together to make C. And as long as they know their properties, the actual chemistry doesn't matter. So um, on the other hand, that I teach chemistry. And so I'm going to show you a number of, during this talk, a few videos. And this is the first one about my teaching chemistry. Well, I do quite a lot of teaching to the first year students. And um, I use dog toys to um, film, uh, to, to, to demonstrate them. It looks like a molecular model, but it's actually called a wiggly giggly. It, it actually looks just like a molecule of the shape of molecule of methane. And what's good is that I have to, I demonstrate to the students that if you rotate this through 120 degrees, it looks just the same. But what's nice is, you see, as you rotate it, it makes a noise. And this really quite excites the students. There's this one that I was using this morning. This one has squeaks like this. This, well, the, 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 this morning we were using this for a molecule that had three fluorine atoms here and two hydrogen atoms at the top, which really is this shape. And having something like this makes it fun for the students and they can enjoy and I was showing them how the molecule bends like this and so on. So this is a new one that I just bought. And I'm not quite sure yet what I'm going to do. It. You can see it's square if you look at it that way. And um, so, but I've got six months or so before my lecture starts so I can start thinking what's the best way to get this in. But it's quite fun. mutual intelligence and affairs with all manners of strangers and foreigners. And this is as defined in the Charter of the Royal Society from 1663. And in fact, the Royal Society has had a foreign secretary for 60 years longer than the British government.
But my role is really to be a sort of ambassador for UK science. There are other people as well who are ambassadors, but I'm one of them. So here you can see me talking to this gentleman here. I meet all sorts of quite strange or unusual people. This is Wun Jibao, who, when I was talked to him, was the um, <coughs> premier of China. This is the, essentially the boss of the whole of China. I'm ashamed to say, you see, there I am standing with this really important person. I couldn't think of anything to say except, hello, it's nice to meet you. But in principle, I have opportunity to speak to all sorts of interesting people. And here is Wen Jibao again on the same visit in the library of the Royal Society, together with the president, Sir Paul Nurse, and our librarian, Keith Moore. And they're looking at a scientific journal which the special issue that was devoted to Chinese fossils. I mean, the impl the, it was not implied that he was a Chinese fossil, but it was a special re <coughs> relevance to China. And in fact, the Royal Society's claims to be the oldest publisher of scientific journals. And our journal, Philosophical Transactions, is going to be 350 years old in 2015. And the reason that we claim that it's the oldest scientific journal is because we invented two key ideas to modern scientific journals. The first one is the idea of priority. I was the first one to do this experiment. And the second thing is that we invented what is called peer review, which is before something was published, some of the fellows of the society would read the paper and decide whether it was rubbish or not. And if it was rubbish, it wasn't published. And the same thing happens nowadays with modern scientific papers. And we're going to celebrate this 350th anniversary with 10 great experiments that have been published um, in the journal. And beginning with Newton's famous experiment where he used two prisms and he split up sunlight with the first prism and then showed the second prism didn't split the color anymore. And then Thomas Young's physics experiment, well, Newton's was also physics, with light in which he did so-called Young Slit experiments. Thomas Young was also Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society. And his biography is entitled The Last Man Who Knew Everything. Because not only did he do this experiment, but he was a doctor. And in his spare time, he was the first person to interpret Egyptian hieroglyphics, you know, these funny writing that they have on pyramids and tombs. He was the first person to work out what they meant. Though if you speak to the French, they will say their guy, Champollion, was the first one, but it was actually young. Anyway, the exhibition is going to be launched in Beijing, hence the connection with China, the Wen Jiabao. And one of the experiments, all being well, is an experiment that's relevant to my own research, which was <coughs> Thomas Andrews' <coughs> description of the critical point. So let me try and explain this to you with a little video. Imagine that you have, well, you don't need to imagine, you can see it. There's a closed vessel, a small container that has a liquid and a gas above it, the vapor. And it could be water and steam. This is not water and steam, but you would get the same result with that. So the question is, what will happen if you heat it up and the vessel is strong enough not to explode with the pressure? So you can watch and actually see what happens. This video has no sound, so you have to listen to me. And so as you start heating it, it will begin to boil. So you can see bubbles forming. And as it boils, material goes from the liquid to the gas. And because it's closed, the glass, gas gets denser, the liquid expands, and the line between them disappears completely. 
And then if you cool it down again, it turns back again into a liquid and a gas. And you get a sort of storm. And I think this is really beautiful. I keep the apparatus to demonstrate this in my office. There are two reasons why it's in the office. First of all, because there's nowhere else to keep it. But also, I use it when I'm interviewing people who would like to come and work with me. If they look at it and say, wow, I know they're suitable to work with me. If they look bored, I suggest they might like to go and work with Professor X or Y in, in another department. And so this is a very simple thing. Let me just show you again, because I think it's fun. Um, and what happens is that as you heat it up, when this line disappears, you have a highly compressed gas. And this gas is a so-called supercritical fluid, and it will dissolve materials. And this is what I use for my research. So you can see it's here. This is the supercritical fluid. And you can see it going back for the um, storm. And um, so because I like talking about this, we have taken it to places. For those of you who live in Nottingham, not necessarily the Loughborough Grammar School pupils, this is the Victoria Shopping Centre, is the main shopping centre. And a few years ago, we set up a display um, just behind Santa's Grotto. So you imagine the children go in, see Santa, feel disappointed, come out, and wow, <laughs> there's supercritical fluid, and the afternoon is saved. And here you can see my colleague Sam Tang demonstrating the equipment. Um, <clears throat> I looked at the slide this afternoon. I have no idea what this cabbage is growing out of the young girl's head. Um, so uh, shortly after we started doing these demonstrations, the university started a YouTube channel, which was called Test Tube, which was to make videos about the lives of scientists. And they were different from the usual videos about scientists. If you watch, say, a Horizon program on BBC about some big discovery, there's absolutely no excitement because you know that the scientist has made the discovery or they wouldn't have made the program. The idea with these is that <clears throat> they showed the life of scientists as they went along, and nobody, not even the scientists, knew what was going to happen in the future. So this one here shows us somebody who's just opened a letter saying that he's got some money to do research. And he was videoed opening the letter, so he didn't know what was going on. He had this, another video where he opened the letter and it said, sorry, no money, when he didn't look quite as happy. Um, anyway, this video, these videos were on YouTube, and I saw them after they had been going for about a year, and I got really excited and wrote to the communications department of the university saying how good they were. And fairly obviously, I was invited to make some videos. So I made one on supercritical fluids. And you can see here's me in with the equipment. And this has now been watched by, you can see here, um, somewhat over 200,000 people. Um, Now, these videos were all made by an Australian um, journalist living in Nottingham called Brady Harron. You can see here's a picture of him and me. And, um, and this is his hand. Um, and Brady and I really got on well together when, during this videoing. And so we started emailing each other and so on. And after a little while, I mean, sort of two or three weeks after I'd made these videos, he um, emailed me and said he'd had an idea. He would like to make a periodic table of videos on YouTube with one video about 
each element in the periodic table. And I told him he was completely mad because it's, it's obviously very easy to make videos about hydrogen or sodium, but how on earth could you make a video about, say, element 117, which at the time not even one atom had ever been made? So how could you possibly make a video about an element that doesn't exist at all? And we had quite an argument, but he persuaded me that perhaps we could try. And so we made, the vi I got some money to make the videos, and we started making the videos. So if you click, for example, on hydrogen, there's a bit about hydrogen and an explosion. And so we had a very, the, the money I had got, for those of you who or at school, you may not realize, but in large organizations like this hospital or the university, there is some money which you only have for a year, and if you don't spend it by a certain day, it's gone. And the money we had for making this gave us five weeks to make the videos or we would lose it. So we made 120 videos in five weeks. That's 118 elements, an introduction, and a trailer. And this is the trailer. So this sample, it's a very, very interesting sample. It's arsenic. This is a dewer of liquid nitrogen, and you can see that the nitrogen is evaporating from the top. That's brilliant. The per stands for perborate, and the S sil stands for silicate. Oh, it's on your camera. One of my colleagues who used to work with it described it as evil. The phosphorus is oxidized in the air to generate a nice P for phosphorus. Because it has a coating of oxide on the surface. Now it's packed in argon because argon is very, very inert. It doesn't react with anything. Ever since this, I get quite excited. I can see lots and lots of lines in the blue and the green region, and these are all specific to the individual atoms. This one just has more data than you could possibly want. You can see the different grain sizes. And you can imagine the periodic table a bit like a family photograph. Woohoo! And there she blows! <laughs> so we started filming on the. Um, 9th of June 2008, and we finished on July the 17th. And so we had 120 videos and a total time of four hours, three minutes. This is approximately the length of two blockbuster films or three arty French films. So it's, um, so it's quite a long time to watch a film to make so quickly. I mean, my brother takes year to make, or more, to make that amount of film. And this is slightly old data, but this shows you, um, <clears throat> after a couple of years, the number of people who had watched the different elements. So the ones that are bright red are more than 200,000 people, and even the pale blue is more than 10,000 people. And you can see this element UUS, which doesn't exist, had been watched by more than 40,000 people. And these numbers since then have, should be probably multiplied by two or three to give you an idea. And there were all sorts of comments on YouTube because people can leave comments. So the first one, these are just a selection that I like. Awesome bids, I wish I'd found them before I did my science GCC exam. Now, what this doesn't say whether this is somebody who's just at AS level who was sad they didn't have it last year, or it's a 40-year-old who's just <coughs> really upset that his youth was misspent. Um, this one, I love your videos. Just watching these videos, I've learnt more than a full term at college. <laughs> and the bottom one, videos like these is what makes me interested in school and better improving myself. Thank you. So you can imagine we were quite pleased. And there was quite a lot of um, 
<coughs> publicity in the press. Um, I'm slightly ashamed to have got into the Daily Mail. Uh, this is one of the leading um, Russian business newspapers, the BBC Turkish Service. Did you know that the BBC had the Turkish Service? And this one, which is from an Israeli um, <coughs> business newspaper, uh, I don't read or understand Yivrit, but eventually I had this translated. And the key sentence says, looks as if he went into his barber's and said, give me an Einstein, but make it wild. And, <laughs> and um, but then people put, we thought we'd finished, you see. Um, so started putting up comments like, this one, I don't care what they do as long as they keep making videos. So suddenly, we found that instead of having something we did just for a few weeks, we had an ongoing project. And you can see this is more than five years ago. And so we had to start taking things forwards and developing PTOB's table of videos. And one of the things you have on YouTube are subscribers. These are people who, when they log on, they're told that you've made a new video. And at 8.44 this morning, there were 358,212 subscribers. And the number goes up somewhere between four and 600 a day. I should also point out, since you may not realize it, that today is particularly special because it's 12, 11, 12, 13. And consecutive numbers are not going to occur for another 93 years. So you should enjoy today because in none of our lifetimes will this ever happen again. And um, so we started making all sorts of extra videos, special videos. For example, for the Chinese New Year, we made the video about tea, um, or chemistry of tea. Those of you who read Chinese, this is tea, and that is chemistry, and I'm not sure what that means. And um, you can see here me sitting in my office with um, green tea and demonstrating that black tea acts as an indicator, like litmus. If you put lemon in it, it changes color. So this is with lemon, that with that. And then we started going to visit places. This is in the control room of the accelerator where element 112, Runtigenium, I'm sorry, 111, Runtigenium, um, was synthesized. I believe that Runtigenium has the worst name of any element since it's almost unpronounceable to non Germans. And it really not, doesn't slip off the tongue like some other elements. And we started putting on subtitles. So there are subtitles in English, and here are some in Spanish. Now, you can ask, why, what is the purpose of having subtitles in English? And there are really three reasons. First of all, some people are deaf. Secondly, a lot of the people who view are not native speakers of English, so it's useful for them to have the text underneath. And the third reason is, if a whole group of people are watching in class, <coughs> and they don't have headphones, if you have uh, um, subtitles, then they can, each can watch with the sound off, and you don't have m me and my colleagues' voices playing different things all over the classroom. And we started traveling. This is um, the International Year of Chemistry in 2011. There was an exhibition based on our, um, ex uh, on our videos in Rio, in Brazil. And Brady and I went, and these are the people who made the exhibit, and everybody tried to make their names out of the elements. So Brady, you could see, got quite well. I was left with a particularly lousy lot of 
elements at the end to try and put Martin Polyakov. But and these people made the exhibit, and the first thing we knew about it was that they sent us an email saying, why don't you come and see our exhibition? Um, since the title of my lecture has the word sugar in it, um, I thought I should just mention sugar. Sugar is not an element, it's a compound. And we have made a whole series of videos about um, molecules. Um, some of them are not, so frog poison is not perhaps a molecule. And you will see here, wherever it is, cheeseburger is not an element or molecule. This is our second most popular video dunking cheeseburger into concentrated hydrochloric acid on the rather weak pretext that you have hydrochloric acid in your stomach. And um, this has been watched by, I think now, 1.6 million people. Um, so when we were in Rio, I made a video, of, we recorded a video about sugar and a <clears throat> Brazilian drink that's called caipirinha which is made of alcohol, it's very alcoholic and extremely sweet. So you can see it's really quite a good anti-drinking video because there's me having just tasted it and it's disgusting. Um, and though Brady quite liked it and drank the rest of the glass. Um, and so we have traveled all over the world and here's me on Bondi Beach, um, again with the wiggly giggly. Um, and wearing my periodic table tie. Um, so any guesses of what molecule I was lecturing about on Bondi Beach? Silicon dioxide? No, that's a good idea. Good, but it wasn't silicon dioxide. That's sand. We, um, it could have been, but it was. I did talk about sand on Copacabana Beach in, um, <coughs> in Rio. This was actually lecturing about ozone and um, how the ozone layer was being attacked by aerosol propellants. Um, I was so engrossed in doing this that I didn't notice the, the women um, walking past me at all. Um, so, we then come to the question whether we're actually making any impact. I mean, are our videos having any effect? And as you may know, the, the younger people may know, that scientists like to write papers to try and discuss scientific questions. So Brady and I wrote a paper on whether we were having any impact. And we wrote this paper in for a journal called Nature Chemistry. And if you think there are several ways that you can, I'm sorry, my machine is, my laser is using up batteries like mad. Um, I will try the other ones. Um, and so you can, th there's, first of all, that you can think about the number of views. Now, the problem with the number of views is that you can't distinguish between a teacher showing a video to a whole class where one view means 30 or 40 people watching it. And somebody who is drunk sitting in their bedroom watching the same video over and over again. And we've had emails saying, I am drunk. I have watched all your videos twice. <laughs> so, um, so views are not very good. With subscribers also, it's not very easy because you can tell how many people you're subscribing, and you can look at other people, other websites. We have three times as many subscribers as the UK royal family. We have 50% <coughs> more than the New York Times, and about nearly double that Chelsea Football Club has. Uh, but what we can't tell, well, we can tell how many people unsubscribe from our videos, that is, they don't like our videos, so they decide not to subscribe anymore. But it's harder to know how many people unsubscribe from other channels. 
and about 10% of our subscribers unsubscribe again. So we decided probably the best way of looking and doing judging impact is to look at the comments that people put on YouTube and the emails that people send. So, for example, 10th of December, that's yesterday, I got an email saying, my name is, I have no idea how you pronounce this, Sibyl Tuda, and I have, I have 14 years old and I'm from Romania. I like chemistry very much and I was very happy when I find on YouTube a channel about chemistry. Your lessons helped me very much because in Romania, in schools, there's a big lack of substances to make experiments. I want to thank you for your work. And I feel that if people, if 14-year-olds is actually sending an email, it's probably genuine rather than some prankster trying to do it because it's too much work. I like this email that I got, which says, it was a bit longer ago, I never took chemistry in school, but I have enormously enjoyed these videos. I work in a high school in the US. I'm a janitor. That means somebody who looks after the building. I will give your website to the science department. I'm sure that will be used in their classes. And I feel if the janitor in a school is excited about chemistry, perhaps we are doing something. And we also get messages from professionals. If, you, if you're lucky enough or clever enough to discover a new element or synthesize it, and you then have to send your experimental results to a committee that decides whether the experiment is good enough, and if you are, then you're allowed to choose the name. So we made a video about the names of elements 114 and 116. They're called fluorovium and livermorium. And just after we made the video, we got this email saying, I just watched your video on the new elements, 114 and 116, and found it exceptionally well done, accurate and insightful. What a delight. And this is from the chairman of the committee who decided that these elements had been discovered. So. You have the two extremes, school janitor and you have the expert of the committee. Um, you can, it's quite fashionable now, you can take a large amount of text and analyze it with a thing like this, which is called a wordle. This is the top 100 words in many thousands of comments. And the bigger the word, the more often it's there. So you can see it has like or really like, you see that? And video is quite big. Chemistry is a bit smaller. And for reasons that may not be obvious to you, that hair is quite a big word as well. <laughs> so, so you can see it is really quite positive comments. And then this was posted on Twitter by saying, they made my awesome new T-shirt has arrived. And if you want, you can buy a T-shirt like this. It's not sold by the university, but you can. somebody has made a T-shirt with my picture on it. Um, and this is Eddie, who um, at the time this picture was taken was aged 11. That's a year older than you, Molly. Or oh, what you will be in a few days, Molly. And Eddie's <coughs> mother was, I don't know whether she still is, was single, divorced, unemployed, and living in Arkansas in the States. And she wrote and said she needed a Christmas present for her son, Eddie, who was a great fan. Could we send a picture? And so here is Eddie opening his present, and here he is unwrapping his um, <coughs> picture. And I feel that unless his mother was really sadistic, this was, he was genuinely excited. And then, um, this is our youngest documented viewer, who at the time of this photo was 18 months old. Um, I think that this photograph is really quite distur disturbing. <laughs> and I said, uh, we, we showed this on the video, and I said on the video that it was disturbing 
and a comment was posted by the father saying, it's quite all right, the guns have been in the family for a long time. <laughs> and then these are some of our students who two years ago baked me a periodic table of um, cupcakes for my birthday with a cake with hair in the middle as well. And it was really quite exciting as it was one of the very first periodic tables I'd seen with the elements 114 and 116 with their correct um, symbols. And we stood outside the lecture theatre giving free cakes to the students. So, but again, I think this shows considerable devotion by this group of students. They worked apparently for two days making this cake. And, and you can watch on the video how they did this. So, this brings us to the questions about why did these videos popular? Why do they work? And there are many things that make them very unconventional in terms of um, educational films. The first thing is we have absolutely no educational objectives. Most people who make educational materials say, today we're going to make a film that will teach people about so-and-so. And the second thing is we never make the videos with a storyboard or a script. So even when I'm about to be filmed, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say and how it will come out. And then it's edited. And if there's more than one person on the video, each of us is filmed separately. So we have no idea what the other one's saying. And although the videos are made or by the university or under the university's badge, there is no corporate message. It doesn't say, come to Nottingham, come to Nottingham, all the time in the video, which many corporate videos do. And what is most interesting is that when a video is made, I and none of my colleagues have any control about what's inside. We are videoed, and the first time we see it, is when it appears on YouTube. And there's just trust between us and the journalist that it'll be nice. And the other thing is that they're quite funny and mostly trustworthy because we don't make very few mistakes. And things sometimes go wrong. We say, we're now going to do this wonderful experiment and it doesn't work. But we often show the video with the thing not working. The other thing is that we do talk and make videos about things that people don't like talking about, like death. And I have made about five or six videos about people who are quite close to me in one way or another who died, sort of video obituaries, always with the, it has to have some chemical connection. But the viewers have seen me almost in tears in some of these videos. And it's been really nice for me because not only making the video was helpful, but they put really nice comments from the viewers saying that they're expressing their sympathy and so on. The other thing is that the videos are made with professional equipment and they're professionally edited, but they often look quite amateur. And this is quite important because British television, even though a lot of the content is complete rubbish, is always made to a very, very high technical level. So when people watch video material, they expect things to be really good, which is why a lot of things that are on YouTube that people have shakily um, videoed on their phones or whatever look so bad, even if what they're videoing is quite interesting. And finally, that there is trust and partnership between the scientists and the journalist. And the other thing which is very important is um, Brady. This is Brady and me in um, Sydney in Australia. We're both obsessive. And he and I, on this occasion, flew separately to Sydney. We met up in a hotel at 8 in the morning 
And by one o'clock, we had made six videos, even though we were both quite jet-lagged. So this is our um, whole team. There's um, Darren Walsh, Neil Barnes, who's our technician, who never speaks. He has become a huge internet hero. But in the videos, he never speaks, but he has an enormously expressive face. And he just looks anguished when we spill things on the floor and so on. It's Rob Stockman, there's Brady, Steve Little, me, um, Debbie Case, Pete License, and um, Sam Tang. You may wonder why we're wearing colored lab coats. If any of you are teachers, you might like. We wear colored lab coats so that the students can immediately see who is in charge if something goes wrong. In school, it's easy because the pupils are smaller than the teachers, or usually. But at university, it's not so obvious. So, and here is the list of the people. And these are the people who, over the years, have funded our um, videos. And so I wanted to end up by showing you one of our videos that is slightly more medical, just to give you an idea of what one of the videos is like. I got a parcel this morning. I think I know what's in it, but I'm not sure, and I'm quite excited. So let's open it. It is from my friend Peter, who is a green chemist. This is sildenafil citrate, compound which probably most people haven't heard of. But it's the active ingredient of the pharmaceutical product that is called Viagra. Like many pharmaceutical products, this is a salt. It's a salt of citric acid. Citric acid is quite a common acid. You find them in citrus fruits, oranges, lemons, so on. So here, there's 17.98 grams. So this is more than enough to make over 300 standard tablets of Viagra. Now, I'm not going to open it, because after that, none of my male colleagues would want to come into my office. Might not want to go into it myself, because Viagra is a very potent drug. And it's a potent drug which causes blood vessels to distend, that is, to expand, so blood flows around the body much more easily. One of its uses is for treating so-called pulmonary hypertension. So the blood is not flowing into your lungs properly, but if you take Viagra, it distends the blood vessels, and so it's easier for the heart to pump the blood through the blood vessels. It also affects other parts of the body. Like many blockbuster drugs, when it was discovered and developed, people didn't realize all the things it could do. They knew that it would distend blood vessels, but it was only when they were testing it and saw the effect on male rats that they realized that they were onto something quite exciting. You can see the compounds white. If you've seen pictures of Viagra tablets, they're blue. If you cut one in half, and I haven't done, then you would find that the blue is just a coating on the outside. Inside, it's just white, a mixture of this compound with some inert filler so that the tablet is a reasonable size so you can swallow it easily. Like many organic compounds that are complicated, it has a name that is so long, so I'll read it out because I'll never remember it otherwise. It's 1,4-ethoxy-3,6,7-dihydro-1-methyl. Are you following me? 7-oxo-3-propyl-1-H-parazolol-4-3-D. That means it's right-handed. Pyrimidine-5-ile-phenyl-sulfonyl-4-methyl-perazine-citrate. When Viagra was first made, for each 10-gram sample, that's about half what I've got, they needed to use 13 and a half liters of solvent. But then, after Peter Dunn applied the principles of green chemistry, they got this down just to about 60 milliliters of solvent. 
and that's a huge reduction in the amount of solvent. And they not only reduced the volume, the solvents they used were environmentally much more friendly. So thanks to my colleague Chris and the wonders of video, I now got a model of the molecule. And you can see there's a sulfur atom here, which is yellow. The red ones here and here and here are oxygen atoms. And the blue ones are nitrogen atoms. The others are carbon and the, or hydrogen. And you can see the benzene ring here and another six-membered ring here. And it looks quite complicated. Chemists have designed this so that it will fit into a particular place on the enzyme that they're trying to stop operating in the body. There is an enzyme called phosphodiesterase, which is known in the trade as PDE5. What happens is PDE5 causes the blood vessels to contract. And obviously, it is quite embarrassing if at the wrong moment your blood vessels suddenly contract when you'd really like them to relax. And so what Viagra does is that it fits into the active place on the enzyme, the so-called active site, and blocks it so the molecule can't work. And this is why chemists have designed this molecule so the various nitrogen and atoms are in just the right place so that they can bond on to the hydrogens or whatever in the active site of the S enzyme so it just doesn't work and your blood vessels stay really dilated till you're ready for them to go down. Thank you. I hope you'll ask some questions now. Elements you've got to do. Oh, no, we've done all the elements. Um, but, and we've done some of the elements several times. Um, for example, um, with the element cesium, we, have, we had a tiny drop of piece of cesium that we put in water, and we've put bigger and bigger amounts of cesium in. We've done it in slow motion. And um, then... So we've done all the elements, and some of the original videos, which are still there, are not terribly good, and we need to do them again. And we also have to visit the site in Dubna in Russia, where they've synthesized quite a few elements, and I'd like to visit and see the equipment they've done. It. We've been to the um, accelerator in Darmstadt, where they made some elements, but there's Dubna, and there's also the Lawrence Livermore Lab in the States as well, where they've synthesized elements. And who knows, there may be more elements. Um, but since um, we started, and when I st started, I thought the periodic table was complete. But since we've started, element 112 has been named, element 113, 114, 115, 116 have been um, confirmed. Well, 113, 115 haven't been confirmed yet, and 117 has had some atoms made as well. Element 113 was made in Japan, and we made, a spe we made the same video twice, once in English, and then it was also uploaded with a Japanese um, commentary. Um, with a Japanese translation. And um, the day after element 113 was announced, I met the Japanese ambassador in London, and I shook his hand and congratulated him on the discovery of the element, and he looked a bit surprised. Um, it, it's basically a positive experience. You didn't actually, you didn't actually mention the negatives, particularly what the educationalists think about your hand. And they're, they're delightfully positive. Um, I, I should say I've had no training in teaching apart from two very unsatisfactory days when I was in University of Newcastle 
aware there were a few lectures from people who clearly didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and, but now I'm invited to educational conferences, and the Education Division of the Royal Society of Chemistry gave me a silver medal. So I think they're very positive because, um, and teachers like the videos because they're quite short, so they can show them in lessons. And so I think the message that we put over in our videos is that your teachers are excellent, but chemistry is even more exciting than the teachers make it. So um, we have had, I've had a chemistry teacher from Seattle in, on the west coast of the States who arrived in my office to present me with a little mole, um, the, the animal, which had been made by one of her girls in her class because they liked it. So we've had very, the only criticism we have occasionally had is that people say that we're doing experiments that are quite dangerous and don't give enough safety warnings. I, I seem to remember that on your office wall you have a signed copy of the score uh, well, the, 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 the answer is it's actually in the corridor outside my office that we have. Um, no, it's not a signed copy of the score. It is a signed letter to say that we can hang up a photocopy of the score without breaching copyrights. And first of all, I don't know the words of the song. And secondly, even if I did... I cannot sing a note in tune, and it would be a very sad ending to the evening. Um, there is rather a nice version of the um, Elements song. There, there are lots and lots of versions of the Elements song, including Daniel Radcliffe has done one. Um, but there are two um, Japanese schoolgirls who do uh, quite a nice jazzed-up version of the um, song. Unfortunately, I cannot show it to you because this hospital blocks YouTube as being unsuitable for their clientele. But um, you can easily find it. It is amazing some of the things that interest people. Um, a few years ago now, it must have been about three years ago, um, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry redefined the atomic mass of certain elements, about 10 of the elements, which they said rather than having a particular mass, they could have a range of masses because they're elements like chlorine that has more than one isotope. And depending where the chlorine comes from, the ratio of the two isotopes is slightly different. Um, and we decided to make a video about this, and I had to record it three times before Brady thought I was sufficiently enthusiastic about it because atomic masses are pretty boring. And a week later, I was in South Africa, and a woman came up to me and said, what a wonderful video we had made about atomic masses. So um, what we have done recently um, in the summer we have bought a high-speed camera. So we can now video things at a very much higher frame rate. And you saw, for example, the video of the balloon bursting when you put a match to it. If you do that with high speed, you find the really surprising thing is that the balloon completely disappears before the hydrogen catches fire because the rubber pulls it away so quickly. But if you fill the balloon, and this is quite dangerous, you should not do this at home, if you fill the balloon with a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen and put a match to it, then the balloon lights up like a light bulb, and the reaction is very much faster and is essentially largely over before the balloon has burst. And um, it's now actually more a question of finding time to shoot the videos because Brady has a physics channel, he has a maths channel called Number File, and he's videoing like mad. In fact, he's making maths 
videos at this moment in San Francisco. And my colleagues, who were quite young when we started this, have become much more eminent. Um, <coughs> two of them who were lecturers when they started are now professors. And they're getting more busy and finding the time. So, but there's no problem in thinking of things to do. And our next video, which will be uploaded, uploaded in the next day or two, is about a Christmas log, a Yule log. Though there was some delay because one of the experiments involved a $50 bill which got burnt or slightly singed. And it's a criminal offense to deface American currency. And YouTube got rather upset. Um, so there was a question there. Um, we have collaborated with one or two channels. Um, with our first high-speed videos were made with a guy called Destin, who has a channel called Smarter Every Day. Um, he and I were videoed together in my office. He got so excited, he went into hysterical giggles. It was most embarrassing. Um, and you can see that on, the, on, on one of our videos. And there is a guy called Stephen, I've forgotten his surname, who, on the channel called Vsauce, who's based in London. And we've made some videos with him as well. And so we have collaborated with a few people. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I think the, well, the thing which I think is really good about Brady is that he is able to get scientists to speak in front of the camera and be interesting. And unfortunately, if you look at a lot of videos of scientists, they are incredibly boring, especially the videos that scientists make themselves about their own work. They're, I mean, they're, they're embarrassingly boring. Um, and Brady somehow manages to ask all sorts of questions that puts the scientist on the spot. We made a video about the 2008 Nobel Prize, which was given to <coughs> three people, and I've forgotten their names, who had isolated a green fluorescent protein from an octopus and done wonderful things. And so while I was making this, recording this video, Brady suddenly said, shouldn't the octopus have got the Nobel Prize? And so I was put in a spot, you see. So I said, no, I didn't think so because the octopus hadn't understood what it had done and it needed the scientist to explain. But it's being asked questions like that, which really puts one on the spot and gets interesting answers. And he's very good at um, interviewing. He's taught me that if you interview somebody, you shouldn't say to them, what is the most exciting thing you've ever done? Because you don't get a very ex interesting answer. If you say to them, what is the most exciting and the most boring thing that you've done? You then get a much more interesting answer. And in a lot of these videos, Brady asks me or my colleagues questions, and then those are edited out. So what you see are the scientists asking the questions which the viewers might want to ask themselves. But I think there should be more people, not necessarily all making videos on YouTube, because there's clearly a finite market of people who want to watch videos on chemistry. But they should be using other social media, doing things on Facebook, or whatever the new things that come up. Um, they, no, is the answer. Well, they, they produce, um, Brady has to be paid because it's his job. Um, well, it's his means of living. Um, 
those of us who are participating, it sort of comes in the run of our jobs, and we're paid anyway. Um, we get a modest income now from advertising, which is used for buying extra lenses and things like that. But it's by no means self-financing. But our videos are very inexpensive compared to, say, BBC films. Um, uh, no, um, he, he has, I believe, seen one or two of our videos, but not many. Um, I think um, well, his style of working is completely different. And um, many years ago, he described a five million pound film as being low budget. <laughs> and so, so it is in a different league to us. And, and it's quite, I mean, it, the, his things are carefully scripted and so on. And as you know, in a professional film, you have um, <coughs> the same scene is played several times and photographed from different angles. But if you look at the subtitles on our films, you will realize that normally when you make a video like this, you speak far more than in a real film. In a real film, one character says, I love you, the music plays, and then the other one says, I love you too, or I hate you, as appropriate. And so the actual amount of text is quite small, whereas in ours, the subtitles whiz across at quite a healthy rate because we're talking much more. One of our very latest videos is about me answering some questions from viewers, and one of them asked quite a similar question. It was actually, which was the most, uh, my favorite video? And I think, in general, well, what I replied then, and I still feel, is that um, a journalist once told me that the piece that he was writing at the time was the one he liked best. And as soon as he finished it, he tended to forget it. And so similarly, I always hope that the video we just have just made is going to be the most successful or whatever. Um, the video, I suppose, which I still find the funniest was for element 108, which is called Hassium. And in the first video, I didn't realize the camera was running. And I said, I know nothing about Hassium. Shall we make something up? And that is the opening of the video. Um, our most successful video in terms of views, um, which made had two million views in 15 days, showed me in the bullion vault of the Bank of England. The bullion vault is the gold vault. So you imagine a room considerably bigger than this lecture theater with shelves six high and each shelf with one ton of gold on it. And each ton of gold on that particular day was worth 35 million pounds. And it really looked completely unreal. I thought it looked like the duty-free shop in an airport where you get those big gold Toblerone bars because you just don't believe that there was 4,000 tons of gold around you. And that really was our only video that has gone really viral and was watched on the best day, I think, by 930,000 people. But we have hopes that we will do it again. But there wasn't much chemistry in the video. So I was criticized that it, from the chemical point of view, it was a bit boring. My favorite topic in chemistry. Um, well, I suppose the subject that I'm really keen on is green chemistry. And I haven't worked in green chemistry all my life. It was only invented 20 odd years ago. And not by me. But, and I feel, particularly in the present time, when the amount of um, raw materials in the world are getting depleted and running out, that it's really important to try and invent new ways of making chemicals more efficiently. The world's population now is more than 7 billion. And most of those 7 billion people 
are con and all of us are consuming far more than our fair share of the Earth's resources. And there are 1.4 billion people who are profoundly poor. And a convenient definition of profoundly poor is somebody who can list everything they own out of their head. And if I ask you how many socks you own or whatever, you probably don't know. Whereas they can list everything they own. And so, because I come from Nottingham, I have put this into a question, which is how can we make enough material for the poor people without robbing the rich? Because people don't want their standards of living to go down, but on the other hand, they can't consume so much. So what we've got to do is to supply the chemicals and materials that people need, but using less starting material. And at the moment, making chemicals is often a very messy process. Each laptop generates about a ton of waste to make a laptop. And as you heard there from Viagra, when it was first made, used 1,350 um, liters of solvent to make one kilo of Viagra. So I suppose that is the area which I feel most strongly about. My father and grandfather were physicists. Uh, my mother trained as an actress, and which is perhaps why my brother became a playwright. It was sort of assumed, since I was really small, that I would be a scientist. And I assumed that I would be a physicist, but I wasn't good enough at maths. And um, at my equivalent of AS level, um, or that year, I got 13% in my maths exam. I got better in the A-level year. But, um, so, but I had a very good memory, and so it's still not bad. Um, so I found learning chemistry very easy. And I still get fascinated by the color changes and things in chemistry. So, but there wasn't some moment when I suddenly knew I was going to be a chemist. I just sort of happened. I just asked my colleague, Sadhana Chandra Sekhar, to give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we first uh, stumbled across the um, um, across the element videos when we were looking up uh, Tom Lehrer's uh, song that was mentioned some time ago. And we've never looked back since. I think we've probably uh, watched most of these videos now. And part of the thing was enhanced by the fact that your uh, PhD student was actually the boys' tennis coach. And that seemed to sort of perpetuate the association between us. Um, you've been quite uh, modest about your educational aims. But I think what's come through this evening is the passion that you have for teaching, and um, thank you so much for sharing that passion with us. It's really been quite inspirational. And I think if there's one message that the young people can take home is that chemistry perhaps is the road to internet stardom, and uh, well, Bondi Beach, Rio, what's not to like, I think. So I've also been to India. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if any of the younger ones want it, I have cards with the URL of the website that you could have one.